Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris back again. I cannot believe that it is. we've been doing this podcast for, what, four years now? And we have not talked about Dream Theater's Metropolis Part 2 Scenes from a Memory. But alas, on its 25th anniversary, here we are. An excellent selection and, and quite frankly, long long overdue but before we talk all things dream theater from 25 years ago how are you my friend i'm good this was one of those albums that i was sure you were going to choose like really early on when we first started the the podcast and and maybe the fact that i i chose a dream theater album pretty early on in the process um with falling into infinity i just thought that that would make for kind of a more interesting conversation because there's so much derision for that album um and this one i just felt like it was probably going to be more of a a praise session but i i I was a little surprised that um that you didn't choose it kind of earlier on in the proceedings but it might have just been my own fault for just constantly choosing dream theater albums ahead of you and then you feeling like okay we just did a dream theater album and then as you may have been warming up to pick one i would just pick one again um (laughs) So, uh, other than, other than our bonus episode on, uh, a change of seasons, which we, you know, released to the general public a, a couple of weeks ago, that, that was the only dream theater album you've chosen so far. And I've chosen now, uh, four. Uh, so, um, I, I think that probably is probably one of the more, uh, surprising aspects of this podcast up to this point. Me being the dream theater mark that I am, it is a bit surprising, but it is also, very timely. As I said, 25th anniversary of this album, uh, new single with Portnoy back in the band, uh, their new world tour about to kick off in just a matter of days. And of course, the fact that they have their new album coming out in quarter one of next year, there's a lot going on in their camp. So I have a feeling that we'll be doing more of their stuff in the not so distant future, but it just makes sense to do this album now. And, and I'm glad that you chose it. Obviously I've got a lot of thoughts on this thing. And I cannot believe that it's been 25 years. But again, before we talk and really go into the uh, the devil in the details, as they say, with this album, I have to ask you, have you had a chance to listen to the new Frozen Crown? They, they came out earlier this week, and um, I, I'm not nearly the fan of this band that you are, but I will say, I thought it was arguably their best album in the entire discography. It was a really solid album from, from beginning to end. Uh, I don't, especially in recent times, I don't do this a lot. I don't listen to albums like the day they come out. Um, just because I'm so always so behind on things that like I just kind of wait until I get to it. But this was one of those albums where after seeing them perform at Prague Power and actually getting to meet the band backstage and just seeing what a bunch of great people they were it made me all the more excited to hear this album. Never mind the fact that all of the singles that have come out ahead of the album have been fantastic. So this was just one of those things where I was like, ah, oh, screw it. I'm listening to this the day it came out. And that happened to be yesterday as the time of recording. And man, I enjoyed the hell out of this. Um, the single steel and gold, which I think was the very first single that uh, was released in August, which I do believe they played at Prague power as well. It might be one of my favorite songs that have come out this year. I just think it's such a good song. Maybe my favorite Frozen Crown song up to this point. And I've only gotten a chance to listen to the album once, but um, this might be my favorite Frozen Crown album. Uh, I just thought this was really good. I don't know if it had anything to do with the addition of Alessia Lanzone on, uh, as the third guitar player. Um, I can't imagine how much she came in and, and was like contributing to songwriting or anything like that. But this, I feel like the band is really hitting, um, hitting its stride right now with this lineup. And, uh, I, um, I'm very excited. I'm, I happen to be friends with every, well, everyone in the band on Facebook and, and every one of them has just been posting how uh, proud they are of this album and how excited they are for people to hear it. So I highly recommend it. If you're not familiar with them, it's just really, um, really just, great melodic power metal um i i i love it um and i think it's great i i look forward to uh, coming back to it but it's probably going to make my list and it, it's more of a question of uh how how high rather than 
if if it makes the list at all. Um, but as of right now, it's the only album from quarter four <laughs> that I've actually listened to, with the one exception of um, Timo Tolki's uh, re-release of the Fourth Dimension demos. Um, he he I, he found the the masters, I believe, and cleaned them up a bit. And uh, I, I gave that a listen to yesterday, just because I needed something that I didn't feel like I needed to concentrate a ton on. And since I knew all those songs, it was an easy listen. But it's really fascinating hearing those songs that would end up being sung by Timo Koti Pelto, actually sung in the demos by Timo Tolki. Um, it was like this weird combination of dream space and fourth dimension. Um, but, uh, it was cool hearing such a raw, like, take on these tracks. Um, for those who are not a fan of 030366, I'll just tell you that you got, when the album came out in 1995, you got the better, more polished version oh. of, of, of that song because the demo is pretty brutal. That is um, frightening. It's... That is frightening <laughs> because I remember lambasting that when we covered the album. I can't imagine it getting worse, but I guess here we are, huh? It's worth listening to just to hear the end of the track because it just goes zero three zero three six six over and over and over, but each time it gets a little bit slower and more more drawn out. And just when you think it's over, he, he says it again, even slower, and like it almost became a parody of itself by the end of the song. Um, but it was really cool to hear. Um, like original versions of Twilight Symphony and We Hold the Key and Distant Skies, which I think had um, some different lyrics than what we ended up with. Ga- the original version of Galaxies was really cool. Um, so I uh, will point you in the direction of uh, Timo Tolki's Bandcamp page, which is timotolki.bandcamp.com. I'm not 100% sure that this is available anywhere else. So... Um, that's where you can you can listen to it for free or you can buy it um, from the from the Bandcamp page. And uh, I do believe his Classical Variations and Themes 2 album is uh, also available uh, currently as well. So um, you can check both of those out uh, on his Bandcamp page. And uh, I'll, in, the, in the meantime, I'll take a quick look and see if it, they're uh, available in the iTunes store. I don't know if he had plans of re- releasing the fourth dimension demos anywhere outside of Bandcamp. The classical variations and themes two album is uh, available for pre-order on iTunes and will be uh, released on November 4th, but the album is available on Bandcamp now if you're uh, in a rush to hear it. Nice. Nice. I want to go back to Italy briefly for a second because another album came out from a, uh, We'll call them a power prog type of hybrid thing. And it's, it's a band that um, I think I mentioned when, when I heard that they had gotten back together and I heard the first single. But the band is Athena, uh, starring none other than Fabio Leone on vocals. And when I heard this, I should also note that they've changed the name of the band from Athena to Athena 19. And that's uh, with Roman numerals after Athena. But I heard this album and I said to myself, um, it's been tw- over 25 years since a new religion came out over 20 years since their last album came out in 2001, but uh, they've come a long way with the production and just the uh, overall sound of this band. I think you're going to enjoy this one. It is um, power metal, very much in an angry style, but with a little bit more progginess to it, especially with the element of keyboards and stuff like that. So I think you'd be remiss not to give this one a shot as well, just because, um, it has all the elements that make up something you particularly would enjoy. It's on my list. Um, in fact, I actually listened to the new Vision Divine album first, uh, Fabio's former uh, band hmm. that uh, our, our favorite uh, returning uh, returning podcast uh, figure, uh, Mr. Olaf Thorson, known for his uh, high-quality internet signal. Um, that's an inside joke that will never die. Um uh, I, we should get him back on. We have to have one interview with this guy where it where it doesn't get like all garbled and and cut off. But, uh, <laughs> we may have to fly out to him in order to. Yeah, do we it. may have to fly out and hold a microphone in front of his face. Uh, sometimes a wired connection is just the best way to do things. But uh, he, um, I, I, I enjoyed that album quite a bit. I know I'm a little late to the party on that one, but that was quite good. And uh, I, I, I definitely look forward to listening to the. Athena album as well, but uh, good stuff coming out of coming out of Italy. I would argue it is one of, if not the best power metal album 
of the year, that vision divine, it really um, surprised me in many ways. And there's a couple of others that I think will be on my list, but that one uh, will absolutely be on there. It's, it's one of the better power metal albums that I've heard this year. And I uh, just want to mention one other album that came out um, this week, which was something that kind of came out of left field for me. And I'm surprised because it had the makings of everything that should have been on my radar. Number one, it was on Frontiers, a, a, a label that we are intimately familiar with, with, with all their quality releases. Number two, it involves two musicians that play together in Pure Maze, which I absolutely adore as a band. And number three, um, well, it's just one of those bands that, quite frankly, was w- when this came out, I don't know how it flew under my radar, but it involves um, the singer, Nicholas Sane, and Jonah Widengarten, keyboard player for Pure Maze. The band is called Aries Descendant. And uh, the album is called From the Ashes of Deceit. Very, very good. If you are a fan of Pure Maze, they kind of dial up the um, symphonic elements on this one, but the makings of a really good Pure Maze album are there, and I thoroughly enjoyed this one as well. Definitely recommend it. I'll, I'll post one of the tracks this week so that everyone can hear it. Yes, um, we were uh, blessed enough to receive a, a promo copy of this, which I haven't had a chance to listen to yet. But I did listen to the, I think it was one of the first singles that was released, Oblivion. And man, I like this immediately. So I, this has now gone from a band I've never heard of to an album that I'm uh, looking forward to more than most of the other albums I haven't heard yet. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pumped for this and uh, that and, and, uh, I, I'll mention before we move move along, um, just before I forget, um, I had spoken to you earlier in the week about Diane Van Giersbergen, and we always joke, no relation to Anike. They both happen to have the same last name and the same, um, or they both happen to have incredible vocals, uh, but uh, very different people, no, not related, but she uh, is the ex-vocalist from Xandria, and she has been releasing these uh, two singles per year, which will eventually appear on an album called Soul Word Bound, uh, which by your math, uh, and since you're not Scott Steiner, I'm going to trust you <laughs> that this album will be available in 2027. There's based a on 33 the and a third percent chance that this album came out in 2018, but I, no, I, I digress. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so she released her latest single, Flameborn, uh, which uh, featured... Um, Marcella Bovio, uh, who you probably know from Stream of Passion and Arion. Um, another really strong track. It's, it's interesting how she's choosing to really stagger these singles. Um, but each track has, um, different guests, not just guest vocalists, but also guest musicians. Like it's almost like a different band has been. Uh, tasked for each track and there's like members from Delane and just, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go through it all, but um, you can go to the, uh, her website and it'll have the, for each track, it'll show you all the people that were involved. And she's doing this with um, Juiced or probably, it's probably pronounced Juiced uh, Vanderbrook, who um, has a lot of history with uh, I think Arion and Stream of Passion and that sort of thing. So, Definitely recommend that. I love Diane's voice. I think I said to you, she's probably my favorite. There's, Andrea's had a lot of singing. They're on their fourth or fifth vocalist at this point, but she might be my favorite one that they had. I'll, I'll never forget that, uh, that first single that they released when she first joined the band. I was very floored. And it would also happen to be a really good song, but, um, I, I'm a big fan of her. So, uh, I, I definitely recommend checking that single out. And if you haven't heard the previous, I believe this is, uh, let's see, they, she's had three tracks prior to this. If there's one with uh, that Aryan um, did a guest spot on. Um, so check out the singles. They're really good. Um, I look forward to when the album <laughs> finally is completed. I mean, we'll know all the songs by then, but uh, similar to what Trick or Treat did with their last album where they released like one song every month for the whole year until they had a full album. Um, it's an interesting way, a little more modern way of releasing songs, but I definitely recommend it if you're a fan of uh, symphonic metal. I love this track. Um, I have become such a big fan of Marcella Bovio's vocals, and she really does have a prominent role on this, to say nothing, of course, of, of Diane's vocals. But together, I just thought it sounded so good and so powerful, and it was the best Nightwish track I've heard this year, and that should tell you something, because Nightwish came out with an album. But I'll, I'll just say it was a really enjoyable <laughs> listen, and um, 
they're slow playing this thing, obviously, because I don't know when the album's actually coming out. I, I think it's 2027, but at this point, nothing would surprise me, but I will enjoy the hell out of it when it does. And I can kind of listen to the whole thing in it, in order how it was intended, etc. So lots of good stuff. And um, I have a feeling it's going to be weird when it comes out and you're going to be like, wow, I remember this song from 2023 when it, when it first came out four years ago. Exactly. Exactly. But uh, nonetheless, I am looking forward to it. But with that, let's talk about Scenes from a Memory, Metropolis Part 2. This album came out October 26th, 1999. And I'm going to ask you a question that I typically don't ask you, but I think it's appropriate in this case. What were you doing the day that this album came out? Well, I feel like it's a uh, that you're baiting me with this question because you were literally uh, standing next to me for most of this day. But uh, it sounds like you would like me to reveal that the answer to that question, and I will. Um, me, you, uh, Mike, who we've talked about many times. Um, I, 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 I'm not. A, I'm trying to remember because I, I have a picture of the three of us. I do not remember. Um, if Nick, Ryan, or Brian, or any combination of those three were with us, I want to say Nick and Ryan definitely were. I can't quite remember if Brian was there. But anyway, we, um, what was really kind of amazing to us at the time was that uh, at Roosevelt Field Mall on Long Island, uh, there was a Sam Goody, and it was located in the basement of the Roosevelt Field Mall. And we would go there. And we became friends with um, one of the guys that worked there. His name was uh, Charlie, who we've actually become reacquainted with thanks to our good friend uh, Charles uh, kind of making that connection with us. Uh, Charlie Selecchia is his full name. And he worked at um, the Sam Goody. And, and he ha- had noticed us looking at, at metal releases. And uh, we kind of bonded over that. And we would go down there and talk to him about that. Sa- he was a, the biggest Sabotage fan you could ever imagine i think he convinced us to import the dr butcher album at one point which we did like um so anyway uh you know he tells us that um the dream theater is having a like a release event at this location for scenes from a memory where on the day of the release uh the band would be there to sign autographs like sign you know your, your brand new copy of the album um and, and then they, you know, and it was just like a release party in so many, in so many words, which A, I had never even considered was a thing at that point in my life. We would have been, uh, 17 years old at the time. And, um, uh, and so like, it was like so exciting because, um, you know, I never thought that like I would be able to go to like a a place like a like a Sam Goody or or the Wall or or whatever and see a band that we listened to that was in the metal genre that wasn't like Iron Maiden or Metallica because to us like and maybe uh, Dream Theater has certainly blown up quite a bit since then but they are you know weren't quite what they are now but I think they were still fairly popular in 1999 and and there was a quite a crowd that attended this thing but. Um, it was just like one of those things where, you know, this was before Prog Power and we had been like, you know, hobnobbing with band members because that's just the way Prog Power is. Like, I don't know that I'd ever met a musician in person, like uh, up until that point. Um, and, and, uh, you know, the whole band was there with the exception of, uh, John Petrucci. He was in Italy doing some sort of guitar clinic, I remember. So I still to this day, I, I think I had told this story before. I have the, the booklet for scenes from a memory still missing the John Petrucci signature. I have to go on the Mike Crea, Dan Zimmerman, you know, lost and found signature tour. Um, <laughs> but the other four members of the band, uh, you, know, po- you know, Mike Portnoy, John Myung, James Labrie and Jordan Rudis, who was, uh, you know, brand new to the band at the time were all there. And um, they were playing the album on the loudspeaker. So like we didn't actually have to wait until we got home or got into the car to hear it. Like we, I, I feel like by the time we had left that Sam Goody, we knew the album pretty well. Cause we probably had heard it at least twice played all the way through over the loudspeaker. And that did not stop any of us from going home and playing the shit out of this album. Like this was, 
such a huge deal. I feel like this is going to turn, this is going to be a long episode. So just brace yourself because there's a lot to talk about here. But um, that was a day that is just absolutely embedded in my mind. And I'm going to post, I have some photos from it that I'm going to post of, I have a picture of me with James Labrie. I have a picture of me, you, and Mike. I have a picture of uh, Portnoy at the table signing autographs. They also were giving stuff away afterwards. I think um, so. they handed, like, Portnoy's kids at the time, you know, now they're, like, musicians, like, you know, adult musicians. But at the time, he was, like, handing merch to his kids, and his kids would, like, randomly walk out to the crowd. And for whatever reason, like, his son or his daughter handed me um a like an assigned eight by ten of Mike Portnoy with the with the hair the the new haircut and the and the frosted tips. It was like so mid nineties dream theater or whatever, and um, th- it was just cool. They were, I think they were handing. I got a scenes from a memory poster that I had for a time. Like it was just cool. They were just giving stuff away, and so that was just a really um, a cool experience. Um, what what are your memories of that day? That, in, in case there was anything that I I missed, I also have a picture of Charlie from that day that I sent to him. That he was like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you have that. That's so funny." So that is yeah, hysterical. That was- the you know, it's funny. I we used to frequent that store all the time, and and it was like um, the definition of insanity in many ways because you would be looking through the same stacks as if the the CDs were going to change from week to week when in reality. You knew that Ice Earth Burnt Offerings was going to be there. You knew Fighting the World from Man of War was going to be there, and like you knew you that never knew Plus, when that that you never knew when that Master of the Rings double disc would show up. That is true, and you can hear that entire story in the archives. But for the most part, the same stuff was there all the time, and you know, nonetheless, it wouldn't stop us from going in. So. Thank God Charlie told us about this because I would not have wanted to miss this because I also have very fond memories of this day. It happened to be a school day. So I remember going there straight from school and kind of piling in a car. I don't remember if it was Nick's mom or my, I don't even remember how we got there, but we got there and then we just waited in the store that there was this line that just wrapped around the whole store, but they were the right amount of popular at this point. They weren't nobody where there was nobody going to show up, but they hadn't quite blown up to what they are now and what they would ultimately become. Thanks in large part, arguably to this release, right? Because on the heels of falling into infinity, quite frankly, they had been losing some steam. They were very popular with images and words. Awake was widely regarded, but by the time you got to falling into infinity, I think some of the bloom had come off the rose for many of the hardcore fans, but there was a buzz and excitement about this release and deservedly so. I mean, this was a, in many ways a, a, a callback to um, what the band was and ultimately what it would become. So I remember just waiting online and to your point, hearing the album at least twice for the three hours that we were at that in-store signing. And I still have that Scenes from a Memory poster. My wife will not let me put it in the bedroom, so I have to find a place for it. But I do have it preserved in case I need to, need to pull that thing out at some point. Uh, that's what the guest bathroom is for. Um, <laughs> I, I, I remember this time as just there's there was so much excitement about this album, and it was interesting because like I don't think that any of it was released prior. Like I think no, there were, we, I had not heard a note of this album right. prior but to its release, reason, but yet there, there was, was so much buzz. Yeah, and I think it was because of Jordan Rudis. I think the people that were familiar with Liquid Tension Experiment. Um, you know, the people that were not uh, big proponents of Derek Sherinian, I felt like they thought like this was the missing piece that the band had been missing since Kevin Moore left during the, you know, during while Awake was being produced. Um, I don't know what made people so sure that this was going to be a home run album, but it really turned out to be that way. And uh, uh, to me, I, honestly, to this day, I think it's still my favorite dream theater album that um since jordan rudis joined the band like i just it, to me it's just that's they kind of peaked early <laughs> with him in the band but uh yeah i just i just remember there being such a buzz about this album coming out and, and I, I wonder if that buzz would have been there had falling into infinity not been you know, received the way that it was like if falling infinity had as much fanfare as awake would scenes from a memory be as, uh, you know, uh, you know, excited. Would people be as excited for this album to come out? It almost felt like, 
you know, people were waiting for Dream Theater to do a course correction and they were confident that it was going to happen. And, and sure enough, it did. Yeah, we're very well said. And uh, in many ways, it was a happy accident. Uh, just kind of giving a little bit of the history here. The original Metropolis Part 1 is obviously one of the seminal tracks on images and words that had come out seven years prior. However, at the time, there was no plan to release a part two. They just called the song Metropolis Part One. But while they were recording Falling Into Infinity, they actually recorded some demos involving a lot of sections from some of the key songs from Metropolis Part Two. But it was all instrumental. And ultimately, they would take some of these ideas, combine it with what is now known as Metropolis, you know, the Metropolis Part One, and bang, they came out with this album. And, um, much like Nightwish, they needed to kind of hit a home run here because I think they had just been trending in the wrong direction in terms of popularity and that sort of a thing. And hit a home run, they did. Um, to this day, I think the debate rages on for many people, what is the best Dream Theater album? Is it Images and Words or is it Scenes from a Memory? And depending on when you got into the band and depending on other factors, I think there's a little bit of a split amongst who says which is the best. Uh, I myself have oscillated back and forth over the years, and I still don't know that I have a tried and true answer to that question, but it is a good problem when you are comparing something to arguably the best progressive metal album of all time in, in images and words. So that is about all I can say about this. The album itself is a meaty album. It clocks in at over 77 minutes but I'll tell you, when you listen to it from start to end, unlike some of the albums that we've talked about recently, where I even said like the Maestrick album, which and you're obviously wearing the shirt. I love the music, but I kind of had to break it up into pieces. This album, I can listen to this entire thing and I don't even think twice. Like I, I, it feels like 15 minutes goes by when I'm listening to this and I know this album arguably better than any other album in my collection. Like I could have recorded this the minute that you said, let's do scenes from a memory. I just know this album so well from beginning to end from lyrical content to every single note, which seemed to have a purpose on this thing. Um, there was not a lot of prep work needed this week uh, as opposed to other weeks where I'm, you know, dialing back and, and really diving in deep because I just know this one so, so well. Not only did I listen to this album a lot when it came out, but then, you know, in the infancy of DVDs, uh, one of the very first DVDs I ever purchased was the Metropolis 2000 Scenes from New York DVD, which uh, we're going to talk about those, a couple of those Roseland Ballroom shows, I think, at, you know, after we finish talking about the album itself. But um, uh, I, I didn't attend the show that ended up on the DVD, um, and... I watched this DVD. I bought it when I was in college and I watched this DVD a lot. I mean, nowadays I have like 150 concert DVDs and like choosing one is, is, uh, is the most difficult part of, of the process. But back then it was like, I had this in like the Stradivarius Infinite Visions DVD and that was my like options for music DVDs. So, um, I, we would put this on all the time. Knops was a fan of this uh this album in particular and he enjoyed watching the dvd with me so it was cool to have somebody to watch it with so yeah like you uh, this was i listened to the album once this week and that was really all that i needed it all came back to me i haven't heard this album start to finish in a really long time but it all came rushing back um just uh i i i i just think this is such a a, a classic album and i i was talking to our mutual friend Mike and I was just like you want to talk about uh like a like an album that gives you nostalgia or something that gives you nostalgia man this puts me back in in just a, an exact time period in my in my life um because you know for us like images and words and awake were albums that we kind of backtracked and listened to because we weren't really aware of dream theater when those albums came out and I bought uh, Falling Into Infinity right when it came out, but that was like, I might have bought like a week, like the week before or the week after. I bought those two albums right at the same time. I actually had both of those prior to Images and Words. And I, I knew that there was some trepidation uh, around the release of Falling Into Infinity. So like this was really the first album that came out from Dream Theater where I was a fan 
and there was a, a very high level of excitement surrounding the release. So that as well, uh, I think really, um, got me excited, uh, about it. Um, interesting little piece of trivia from around this time. Um, Mike Portnoy gave an ultimatum to the, the label saying we need, we want, we need to have creative control. Uh, he pulled the whole Kogan card and said, I have, we are going to have complete creative control. Obviously the band had felt like, you know, the label got too involved with scenes from a memory. And I, I definitely recommend you go back and, and listen to our episode. Oh, with falling into infinity. You mean, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Falling to infinity. We've basically covered with this episode. We'll, we will have covered this. I think like the pretty much the entire, yeah, the entire nineties, of dream theater from images and words up to scenes from memory, including a change of seasons, which is now, you know, publicly released. So that now we just need to do when dream day unite and everything that happens after this. But uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, I think that was a big part of it too. And maybe that's part of the reason the fan base had such excitement because they knew the band had that creative control and that they were going to, you know, bring back the the classic dream theater sound, you know, whatever that is that they perceived it to be. Um, and so, as you you know alluded to, they they started revisiting the follow up to Metropolis Part One, which had been partially written during Falling into Infinity, uh, but was never completed or used. And it initially started out as a twenty one minute song and turned into a complete concept album, which, like you mentioned, was is over seventy minutes. Um, with all these, with this, with this really interesting, uh, story revolving around it. Because, you know, if you recall, like, Metropolis Part One was a story about, um, the dreamer and the, uh, sleeper. The sleeper and the dreamer, yeah. And, but it didn't really have, like, a very deep storyline, really. It was just kind of a, 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 a peripheral, like, a, a peripheral story that went along with the song, but I don't think that it was, like, people delved too deep into what it meant. And I feel like they expanded on that um, idea in a massive, massive way to the point where like when the band was performing it live, there was video to go along with the story. Like it's a really interesting, cool story. Um, you know, we've talked about, you know, Mercy Falls and we've talked about Operation Mind Crime and just like uh, the, uh, the, the Abigail from King Diamond, just these really, um, really deep uh, diving, you know, um, narratives that these, these uh, albums do. I don't know that dream theater ever has gone back and done something quite like this. Maybe the astonishing might be the closest thing, but like this was like a real, I mean, it wasn't just a musical uh, opus. It was also like a storytelling opus. Like it was, it was just um, the, the, the timing for all of it just coming together. It was just, you know, pretty incredible. Yeah. And, and without, some of those albums that you talked about earlier, Mind Crime being one of them, I don't think this album necessarily exists. And, and quite frankly, I don't think you get to know the next No Spoon album, the one that we covered with, with those guys um, on the podcast without this album. So you, you see kind of the evolution of, of the concept album and obviously Mercy Falls being another one that came out after this, like you mentioned. But yeah, it's it's. I remember. Oh, by the way, before you continue, No Spoon yeah. just announced uh, they'll be playing at Prague Power Europe next year. I saw and well deserved because that performance was fantastic. Um, just wanted to throw that out there before I forgot. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's wonderful, and I'm I'm happy for them. They they deserve they deserve it to be honest. This I, I remember going home after I got the album, and within short order of bringing the album home, sitting there, CD booklet in hand, and just dissecting the story, which takes a little bit of time to kind of work through. But once you do, you're like, oh, this is pretty interesting. And so I think we'd be remiss here now. We've gone almost 35 minutes. I think we got to talk about this thing in, 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 in long form. Oh, you didn't deserves. tell me we had to talk about the album. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> We're just setting the stage, you know. Oh, um, Lord. This thing kicks off with a song called regression, which is something the band had not done to this point in time, really. And that is a true intro track, but for a concept album, it's kind of important. And it involves just an acoustic guitar, James Labrie, and this beautiful sound of a, a clock going back and forth. And like basically a hypnotherapist 
doing his his magic on 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 the on his customer or what have what have you and as far as the song itself goes you just know it's leading to something big and and something big it does i i think overture 1928 in many ways is the perfect table setter for this album an underrated instrumental track that Every instrument is on full display, and if you had any qualms about Jordan Rudis fitting into this band, it is they're put to bed very quickly by Overture 1928. I always loved how the song had a Metropolis Part 1 vibe to it, but kind of retained its own soul and quality throughout. Uh, and even though it's a lot of solos, you never lose the melody, and I think that that's what separates this era of dream theater from some of the stuff that's come out in recent memories, arguably including the new single, because the melody on songs like this and other songs on scenes from memory are just utter earworms. And I don't know that they've been able to recapture that kind of a magic uh, to, to this kind of level. Uh, you wouldn't get any arguments out of me on that one. Um I think that this was the best possible way to kick off this album. Even though there's a narrative here and they have to stick to the narrative, there also is some fan service that needs to be done here. And this track, Overture 1928, is the band um, making a promise come true that they're going to go back to a sound that I think 99% of the fan base is going to be <laughs> happy about. And Listen, I am always the first person to joke about James Labrie's live vocals in the current day, but this album, he is just the James Labrie that we all knew and loved from the 90s. He just sounds so good. Like, I couldn't imagine any other human being uh, singing this album. No offense to Ross Jennings, uh, who did a fabulous job with uh, Portnoy's band a couple of years back, but... um he was meant to sing this album and, uh, but, but, uh, Overture 1928 is just the, the four instrumentalists who are arguably, you know, one of the best in the world at what they do. Uh, copyright Chris Jericho, who, uh, who happens to be a fan of Dream Theater, uh, as it were, but, um, just, just showing like what it is that makes them so great. This, this tight, cohesive, um, you know, almost three and a half minute collection of solos that, that also help tell this story and like you said there's the album is full of callbacks to the images and words era particularly metropolis part one um which i think is cool you'll you'll pick up on some of that with with home and the dance of eternity and also the beginning of, of this song as well but man that melody that plays in in overture 1928 that you are gonna uh hear again later on um it, it, it's it's a uh, a prelude um, to the la to later on in the album. It's a, it's just a catchy ass song. Um, when Mike Portnoy's Shattered Fortress played this open prog power, I think this is how they opened the show is with uh, the Overture 1928 and Strange Deja Vu. I was just like, I was having a moment. Like it was just, it took me back. I to, completely marked out and lost my mind during yeah, this set. Yeah. Even though it took um, nine guitarists to play Petrucci's <laughs> part. Um, you know, like they had to get nine guys. That's how good Petrucci was. <laughs> nine guys, uh, four keyboard players, three bassists, <laughs> Uh, and Mike Portnoy by himself, of course. Um, and it still didn't have a full sound, but no, no. And he played aside, a I... Fisher Price drum set, which was. Uh, <laughs> I, I just was like, man, I haven't heard this song live probably since the Seeds for Memory tour. So, like, it was just so sick to hear this. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is like this. I, honestly, almost any song on this album could be, I think, either one of our songs of the week. But uh, this is such a cool. Um, this is an amazing instrumental song and uh and it seamlessly uh leads right into strange deja vu which um <laughs> you stay things I, i'm just i'm this a lot of the stuff is just beyond my my verbal comprehension so it's funny you mentioned it i i was thinking about songs of the week and as i listened to the album i i i think that over the course of 25 years each of these songs has been my song of the week at some point or another. Uh, this time around, Strange Deja Vu was definitely up there. This um, this is the perfect opener to the story in terms of being upbeat, 
full of promise. Some of the catchiest verses in their entire catalog and this big melodic chorus. Um, Truth be told, Dream Theater hasn't made a song like this in a very, very long time. I think the riff that permeates this thing is very good, but the drumming is just on another level. And the keyboards are such a great accompaniment to this like low-end sound on this song. And let's not forget, these are amongst the best James Labrie vocals Ever. They, this, this song is just an absolute perfect song. And in terms of the story itself, um, in regression, we know that the protagonist has this like oddly familiar thing going on because it feels like he's never been in this place, but feels like he's got some sort of a connection to what's going on around him. Uh, and then in Strange Deja Vu, he learns that this girl, Victoria Page, was murdered uh, or at least murdered in a past life. But he comes to find out that he himself was Victoria in that past life. So I'll just say that it, it's a little bit of a convoluted story, but I'll try to do my, you know, our best to kind of walk you through it. I but had no idea what up. the hell was going on with this story when we were kids. Like, I thought it was very oh, really? complicated until I think Portnoy went on to like the Dream Theater message board and kind of like kind of spelled it out a little bit more and it, it made more sense. Um, so in retrospect, it's, 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 I think it's a really cool, uh, a really cool story. Your thoughts on, on this track, one of your favorites or. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. I'm going to make it my song of the week as a matter of fact, because I just think that the combination of this and overture 1928, as I actually have always had these two tracks uh, as, as one file on my computer, because I could not picture listening to one without the other. And, and same goes for, um, through my words and, and fatal tragedy, I have as one track and, and dance of eternity and one last time I also have as one track, which is actually how it's listed in the liner notes. Um, there's like, it's like kind of like how streets was where it was like song slash other song because they were so interconnected both, uh, musically and storyline wise that, that you really just couldn't have one without the other. But I just think that this total, you know, piece, even though it's really early on, it's just one of my all-time favorite Dream Theater combo songs. Um, so I, I'm going to bow out early and make this my uh, song of the week, and, and, and we'll see where you land. But um, I, I just think this is such a, a good song, both from the storytelling standpoint, but also just as a song. It's just um, all the, the, the tropes, and I say that in positive way of dream theater, um, all coming in. And, and again, like you said, you really get a, a taste of what Jordan Rudis is all about because he's a very different keyboard player than Kevin Moore or Derek Sherinian was. So like, this is really the beginning of a new era of dream theater, which I mean, now it, the lineup is the same as it was on, on this album, but there was a, a, pretty significant period of time where Mike Portnoy was not part of this band, but uh, you know, this was the beginning of the, the second major dream theater lineup. Granted, it wasn't really terribly different from the first major lineup. It was a, a one person difference, but the, the band sounded significantly different. I think um, during what I'll call the second major era of dream theater was the, uh, you know, the Jordan Rudis era prior to Portnoy leaving the band. Yeah, well said. Let's give it a listen and we'll come back and uh, chug along. Excellent. 
excellent choice with Strange Deja Vu. As I said, I, I nearly picked it myself. Um, just a great song top to bottom. And then we move on to Through My Words, which is this piano-laden ballad with uh, basically a, 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 an interlude of sorts. Um, but it's just the perfect interlude with beautiful vocals, beautiful um, piano sound, and ultimately it is Victoria coming back to kind of tell the protagonist to look into the murder because, um, you know, he doesn't know anything about it, but it's all starting to feel a little bit familiar to him. And I think Through My Words provides that transition to Fatal Tragedy, which is another kind of banger of a tune here as the story goes on. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I kind of forgot how short through my words is. It's really just a minute. It's almost, it almost acts as a, as an intro to scene three with a uh, fatal, uh, fatal tragedy. Um, but just like, you know, I, again, it, it's a really beautiful, albeit short track that really keeps the, the story moving. And I'm glad that you're, um, chiming in with the, the story part of it. I actually wasn't going to uh, go through it all because I feel like if you haven't heard this album by now, maybe you should go listen to it and, and have like a, a fresh perspective. But I'm glad that you're uh, adding that, that little bit of color to it because I think it's so much of this album is the emotion that goes along with the, the story because it is a very emotional story while at the same time being like kind of a, 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 a supernatural, uh, like sci-fi-esque kind of, vibe to it if you believe in in like past life regression and and things like that um you know reincarnation and and things of that that uh nature um as far as fatal tragedy goes probably would have been my song of the week if not for uh strange deja vu i just think this is another really great song but it also um is such a big part of, of the, the story um, and really laying the groundwork for what's going on here. And I'll say like one of the things that I think I noticed about Jordan Rudis's keyboards versus uh, Kevin Moore's is that it felt like a lot of the music, and at least on this album that, you know, Jordan Rudis kind of went with a more traditional like piano sound, like an actual piano. Whereas I think, um, Kevin Moore, it felt more of a, like an electronic keyboard um, in a lot of spots, especially we're going to get to like that little like circusy passage during the dance of eternity that he does. It feels like you're listening to an actual piano and not a keyboard. And for all I know, he was actually playing a, a real piano. Wouldn't shock me considering it's Jordan friggin' Rudis, but um, uh, just another, you know, those, um, you know, those uh, organ, you know, chords that they have throughout the song. Like this is just a, another beautiful, uh, uh, like heavy, but, but like just really good song, very haunting to like when the song itself is haunting, but then when you, you know, lump in the, the actual storyline to it, it makes it even more darker because, you know, we're learning about this, this murder in a past life. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like trying to describe these songs is kind of pointless because I imagine most of the people listening know this album quite well. So I don't feel well, as, I'll, I'll- I don't feel I'll like I need to, to, to be as uh, verbose about the musical portion of things. No, I think that's fair. But what I, I'll, I'll just say that this is the kind of song, Fatal Tragedy, where when the band finally kicks in, this thing takes a dark turn. And, and obviously it goes hand in hand with the story. But it has this haunting feeling, slow, deliberate, and just not as bright as some of the tracks that came before it. And I think it's a good time to shoehorn in the production on this thing is just simply stellar. I mean, it sonically sounds so good. I love the backing vocals during the choruses on this song. I love the riff during the extended solos with the crazy drumming behind it. And I'm glad you pointed out the keyboards because they're not only different from Kevin Moore, but they're very different from the patches that Derek Sherinian had used, not only on a change of seasons, but falling into infinity as well some great dueling solos, just a really good song before you get into Beyond This Life, which is one of the longer songs on the album. And and quite frankly, um, clocks in at over 11 minutes, which is kind of like side one's epic. There's two on the back end, but just kind of filling in the holes a little bit with the story. Um, Nicholas, the protagonist, starts recalling that Victoria is kind of distancing herself from her lover, Julian, 
And um, he's getting into drinking and gambling. And, and through these tough times, Victorious kind of seeks comfort in Julian's brother, Edward, and they begin to have an affair. And at this point, Nicholas is kind of assuming that Julian murdered Victoria out of jealousy and then kind of killed himself. But it turns out that um, doubts begin to creep in as he gets more in tune with what kind of happened in the past. And he actually realizes that he's actually not going to be able to kind of get on with his own life until he figured out what happened to himself as Victoria in the past life. And that's the whole premise of beyond this life. This is an absolute banger of a song from the main riff to the aggressive drumming you just kind of bang your head to this one. And I've seen this song live since this tour where they played the entire album. And I couldn't help but think to myself, again, it doesn't feel like 11 minutes. There are some fantastic bass lines during the verses, which are phenomenal. And it's the contrast between those slower verses and the heavy chorus, which is just awesome. I think that there's some psychedelic vibes with the keyboards on this thing, and one of the most ridiculous John Petrucci guitar solos in the first half of this song. Uh, just absolutely fantastic. It's never felt like a long song to me. Could have easily been my song of the week, but I've locked in on something else. Nice. Um, yeah, I, this to me always has had such a memorable start, where it just kicks in with this heavy riff just heavy as hell like just i i i pictured the dvd actually even more so than the um the studio album just because i remember feeling like there was like this this like one second of silence after the um the hypnotist stopped speaking at the end of the previous track and then there's like when he kicks that riff in live it like it, it like echoes throughout the whole uh, venue and it's just such a cool way to kind of uh, kick things off here. But yeah, it's um, it, it like, it's a heavy song, but then like in the middle, it's like he gets to like this really nice part with like James Labrie when he does this really like fluffy kind of vocals and stuff. <laughs> and like, I love, I mean, Portnoy to me is like one of the most, um, noticeable backing vocalists uh, in a band because his, vocals are so different from Labrie's that it really provides um, such a, a, a cool counterpoint. Um, and it's interesting because you don't hear a lot of drummers uh, doing like prominent backing vocals and Portnoy, I think always was very strong in that, but um, this has everything like, you know, towards the end you have like the, the really kooky um, Jordan Rudis, like keyboards where it's just, it, it almost is like Haken was born like from those, those yes. some of those solos, like 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 he did that solo and like Haken just came out of the keyboard <laughs> at the back of the keyboard and they became a thing. Like what? Like it's just that's how I picture things because I'm insane. But um, <laughs> yeah, this is like pretty much everything you'd want from Dream Theater. It's just like great hooks, uh, amazing solos, uh, Labrie at his best. It's soft. It's heavy. Like it, it, it rolls into like everything that's great about Dream Theater into one long song. And like we like to say, like Dream Theater, they're the masters of, of making a long song not feel that long. I'm looking at you, uh, six degrees of inner turbulence, one of my all time favorite songs that clocks in at about 42 minutes. Yeah, really. Well, well said. Um, we are in complete agreement with this one. And when you need to kind of pull things back a little bit, that's exactly what they do with um, the next track. And what I didn't know, and I literally am learning this for the first time now, this next track, Through Her Eyes, which is the first tried and true full-length ballad on the album, I didn't realize that it was released as a single in February of 2000. I had no idea that there were any singles for this album. I actually thought that Home was the single, but with a radio edit version of it. But I learned something new every day. I would argue that Through Her Eyes is arguably the most underrated ballad on in their discography and maybe better than the, the other one that gets all the recognition on this album. I love this song. It is um, between Labrie's vocals and the backing female vocals on this track, the use of the orchestration behind the guitars and just the Pink Floyd vibe to it. I love this song. 
I love the lyrics. It was actually a low key song of the week candidate, but again, I'm going to go in a different direction. But I think that this has been one of the most underrated songs in their entire discography. Yeah, the uh, Teresa Thomason, who does those um, kind of like gospel esque singer, uh, 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 so, uh, why am I having a hard time understanding words? Um, the, the, <laughs> the words, that, you know, the the lyrics towards the beginning of the song, it just adds such a, a wonderful um, vibe to this. I believe she actually is in the, on the DVD. I think she came yes. out and performed it live, which I think really added um, so much of a, a, a layer to that live performance, uh, having her actually there. And, and again, like you tie this into the story and I think it makes it even more of an emotional um, journey um, I own the single. Um, I remember hearing huh. about it and I was like, I have to own the single because I really wanted that 15 minute when images and words unite live medley, uh, for some reason, I, just ah. really, I really wanted that. Um, because the rest of the, the rest of the single is just, um, two versions of through her eyes, uh, and two versions of home. Um, there's the home edit that you mentioned and then a live version of home. And then there's an edit of through her eyes, which is like four and a half minutes long. And then there's an alternate mix. Um, but, uh, th- it's one of the few like singles I remember going out of my way to buy when back in high school, just because I wanted to have like some of those extra tracks. I'm fairly certain it's the only dream theater single I've ever owned, but I still have it. That's awesome. I had no idea. I'm going to actually have to grab that just because I want to hear some of these, uh, ba- you know, the ba- the backtrack or whatever, or some of the B-sides on this thing. Really, really interesting. And that kind of concludes side one of this masterpiece of an album. We get into Home, which is the way they kick off side two. This is the longest track on the album, nearly 13 minutes long. And I would argue in many ways, I've always felt that this was kind of the, not only the most well-known song on the album, but kind of the linchpin, which holds a lot of the story together. Um, It is an extended intro with almost like a Middle Eastern flair to it. Just a very iconic guitar riff. But I think the bass drum, the the bass and the drums that are behind the riff are outstanding too. It's, It's a really complex piece with a lot of different elements. Callbacks to the original Metropolis and, I'm going to say something that I've probably never said. It's a little repetitive, but it doesn't bother me because it's just so catchy. Um, and, and obviously the, the, the vocal lines where he sing, where Labrie sings, Victoria watches and thoughtfully smiles. I mean, you may as well be listening to images of words, the way they kind of weave that into this song. It's it, really chill inducing in many ways. Um, I just absolutely think that this is a banger of a tune fantastic fantastic drumming and 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 i guess it's kind of where act two of this thing kind of proceeds and and i'll kind of say it this way you know it's 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 the focus on julian's cocaine and gambling addiction which drove victoria away from him in the first place edward feels guilty about deceiving his brother with the affair and decides ultimately that his love for victoria is even greater than his guilt and tries to seduce her while the brother's off you know kind of dealing with his demons dark dark stuff and i'm not even sure i was prepared for something like this at 17 but as i look back on it now um i understood what was going on then it's just even darker now for me i think um i'm talking a lot what do you think of home (laughs) as 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 the start of side two of this album You know, there was a point where I kind of got, and tell me if you agree that I kind of got sick of this song. It kind of became the yes, the the track from from memory. Yes, I did the one track I didn't want to hear. Yeah, like it was just kind of got for a while overrated or overplayed or whatever. Yes, so I kind of felt similarly to it, and so I wasn't really that excited about hearing it again. But then I kind of forgot how good of a song it really is, especially in the grand context of listening to the album start to finish. And like you said, there's like so many callbacks to Metropolis part one. I think this more than anything else really pulls back from that album. Um, I think the, the middle Eastern kind of, uh, I don't know if you'd call it like Egyptian or whatever you want to call it. That sound, I think um, was, 
I don't remember Dream Theater ever doing anything quite like that before. And I think that really made the track stand out. I feel like probably when I was younger, I felt like it was a little drawn out. Um, but now I kind of, uh, I think I appreciate it more, especially I probably went years without listening to it. So now it's kind of like, I don't know. I feel like you couldn't possibly listen to this album. I mean, without any of these tracks, but particularly this one, I think it really ties the first act and the second act together in, in such a way that um, it's kind of necessary. So I, I definitely have grown to enjoy this song quite a bit more. And like you said, like when they do that reprise to see to uh metropolis part one i I mean i get i get goosebumps because it's just that that album to me is like the seminal prog metal album of any band and so like i even anything they could have like did a callback from from that album would have gotten a reaction out of me um but it was just great and again like you got you know portnoy coming in with his backing vocals but yeah this is i think you know as far as iconic songs go I, i'd have to say this is probably the most iconic song from this album yeah i i agree um but is as iconic as it is and and as much as i guess i was over it for a bit i i'm back on board with this thing it's a great song but for musicians for people that are aficionados of 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 their craft many of them would say the dance of eternity is the quintessential album on the track and even though it's an instrumental track it is widely regarded as one of the best instrumental tunes in progressive metal not just by dream theater but by any band i cannot even count the time signatures on this song because they are all over the place but somehow they seamlessly meld this thing together with changes of tempos i i I always think in many ways that it had to be exhausting not only to play this thing, but to come up with the concepts behind this track, because it is simply put nuts. I I don't know how else to say it. This is not even an easy listen for a prog fan because it is all over the place, but it still retains that melody. Um, And, and I'd be remiss not to mention the fact that John my young is an absolute machine. And if you don't believe it, cyborg Myung appears on dance of eternity in a number of spots it is nothing short of incredible um i am not a musician i don't hold myself out as a musician but this track is absolutely incredible yep and more callbacks to metropolis part one throughout the song um, yes. you know the and uh even at the very beginning of the song you hear what i think is a sample from the actual metropolis part one kind of playing in the background almost like it's a like almost like a dream sequence sort of deal. Um, to me, this track represents like the, the marriage of the old dream theater with Jordan Rudis's, uh, you know, style. Like this was kind of like the intro as much as overture 1928, like was kind of like, we're back. This I think really shows it's almost like a preview of what a lot of dream theater would be in the, in the coming years, uh, a, a little bit more. I feel like, um, Rudis has a little bit more of like, a a wild wacky, like, you know, when you expect them to, to turn left, turn right sort of thing. Like, whereas I think Kevin Moore had a little bit more of a, I, I don't want to use the word predictable, but it was just a little bit more like standard. Whereas like, you know, Rudis is just like a, a wizard. Like, uh, you know, I remember like Ryan, you know, our friend Ryan who played uh, piano um, amongst other things um, was always really, really amazed by uh, Jordan Rudis. And I remember him like being into him when he was in liquid tension experiment. And maybe he might've been part of what hyped this album up too, because he was aware of Jordan Rudis. In fact, he, I think he bought me my, copy of uh liquid tension part two for my birthday one year if memory serves. some people are all paul Heyman guy <laughs> ryan was always a jordan rudis guy there is no question about that he was a fan of jordan rudis when jordan rudis still had hair so i mean that what does that, what does that tell you <laughs> exactly um you need a bit of a come down after the dance of eternity and i think one last time provides kind of the perfect come down it starts off with this 
largely beautiful, like largely piano laden ballad intro. And then once you kind of get into the ver- the verses and the chorus, which both have like a whimsical feel to it, the second half kind of picks up with a nice guitar solo and an almost uplifting feeling. I think that in many ways it's probably one of the other bigger underrated tracks on the album. I've always been a fan of this tune. And in terms of like just kind of progressing the story, um, Nicholas kind of goes to visit Edward's old house and he believes that he's kind of solved the mystery. Um, Julian trying to beg for forgiveness from, you know, from Victoria for, 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 you know, his, his vices and whatnot. And then he's, when he's rebuffed, he winds up killing both her and Edward to try to posi- and then kind of frame it as, as, as a double, as like a murder, like a, a murder, double suicide type of thing. Um, and then Nicholas kind of comes to terms with what happens, bids himself fare w- well from Victoria and the hypnotherapist comes back um, at this point, despite the different pleas from Victoria's memories, not to come back Uh, again, some wild stuff, but he's kind of putting the pieces together here, or at least thinks he's putting the pieces together. What are your thoughts on, on, on this track and kind of the way that it leads into the spirit carries on one of the probably most popular ballads in all of prog rock or prog metal. Um, it feels like it is, um, I feel like it's this song feels like more of a, a part of the story than a, than a, a song on its own. Um, it kind of like seamlessly comes in at the end of Dance of Eternity, and um, it's a yeah, like you said, it's like a very chill song, which is kind of interesting because the spirit carries on is it kind of starts out as a mellow song and then kind of turns into like a, a like a like an anthem almost, but. Um, this again too, the end of the song has um, callbacks, I think to Metropolis part one as well, but I feel like it really kind of just is like a connector between um, dance of eternity and spirit carries on. Um, so I don't know that I have any super strong feelings about this track. I think that it's, it serves its purpose, but I will tell you, I found this out to be very interesting. I did not know this, but the voice of the hypnotist is Terry Brown, who was the producer of every Rush album from Fly By Night to Signals. Uh, huh. So that um, he was also involved with the English pop rock band Cutting Crew, which uh, most people probably remember for their song, uh, I've Died in Your Arms Tonight. So weird connection there. But uh, I, I thought that was interesting that they kind of pegged him to be the the the, uh, the hypnotist. I don't. When I was a kid, I feel like I always called him the therapist, and it's like, no, that's not. That wasn't what it was. Um, uh, no, maybe that was that, just is, my, that is true. Maybe I maybe it was me, you know, acknowledging that I needed a therapist, but um, <laughs> it was a hypnotist, uh, and I just I literally just found that out today that it was the <laughs> Rush's old producer was the voice of the hypnotist. I did not know that. I'm learning new things left and right. What I also never knew is that one last time was penned entirely by James Labrie, which is maybe the first and only time he got full songwriting credits for as as writing his own Dream Theater song. Usually, Petrucci and and, and Portnoy have their hands on on some. Some of this stuff, but here it's a, a Labrie song on his own. And then we get to the spirit carries on um, the Petrucci ballad, which listen, I, I, I think I like through her eyes better, but if you told me that um, this was your favorite ballad of them all, I would not be offended. This is the quintessential well-known ballad, beautiful lyrics. Again, those, those awesome accompanying female vocals that you had mentioned earlier, just a very emotional tune. And to this day, I think it's hard for me to say exactly what it is that jumps out about it, but it's that beautiful chorus, get out your lighters, and um, Labrie just nailing this song, probably because a lot of it's in a lower register for the most part. Just an absolute consummate, the consummate ballad. Uh, this is one of my favorite like all, songs of all time. There is something so emotionally just uh, – emotionally – just that just draws you in it's um and what i think the thing i love the most about this song is that you can take the song away from the album and listen to it as an individual track and it doesn't need the rest of the story to succeed as a a lyrically inspiring song like it just feels like an anthem you know that 
if you just listen to it, like, this is something that like, I hope, you know, somebody plays this at my funeral because this is like <laughs> the perfect song, you know, to kind of make people feel a little less depressed about somebody passing away, you know, that the spirit carries on. Maybe not so much in the, in the form of, of a, of a somebody trying to murder your, your, uh, <laughs> your past self or whatever in the, in the current day, you know, we'll get to that. But, um, I, I, this is just one of the, like, all of it, like the, the guitar, um, riffs that go just along with it the the guitar the guitar parts almost feel like they have their own voice and their own lyrics the way that they're played it's just petrucci's way and uh i just i've always loved this song and i think i always will like it's just one of those songs that every time i hear it it makes me feel emotional and the way that it builds because it starts out as just uh you know james labrie and the piano and, and then it, then the drums come in and the song just builds and builds until it just explodes into this just like unbelievable, um, gospel esque ending chorus. It, it, it's, it's, it's cool. If, if not for the story needing to be completed, this really could have been the last track on the album, but you know, the story is not completed and, and you need, that last part of of, in finally free to kind of tie the bow on the the actual story part. But this is just one of the most like, like triumphant sounding songs. It's so good. And and in on an album where the themes are very dark and there's a lot of, you know, kind of just the darkness that surrounds the story and a little bit of the the actual like music itself. This feels like such a, a triumphant, you know, positive, feeling song and just the, you know, like you said, the accompanying vocalist vocals, everything. It's just such a great song. Um, a, another definite, uh, song of the week candidate for me. And one of my all time favorite, um, metal ballads without a doubt. And, yeah, and well, one of, and one of my favorite James Labrie performances ever. Well, well said. Um, but if you notice, I've not picked a song of the week yet, and that's not because I'm picking the whole album, although I kind of want to, um, making it mandatory. And there's listening. no, and there's no bonus tracks. So <laughs> that's all. That's true. So, um, by process of elimination, I am choosing finally free because I, the bow that they tie on this thing is just fantastic that's uh, fine but uh, you you have to pick which minute we're going to listen to so that's your that's job. fair enough I, <laughs> I i and i and i actually know which minute i'm going to choose because i'm going to speak about that in great detail but let's uh let's give it a listen and then i'll tell you not only why i chose it but, but why i chose the minute that i did we'll meet again, my friends. So that is finally free. The the final track for this monster. That was one, that was one twelfth of final. That's, that's, that is true. <laughs> Let me say this, and then I'll go back to the story. Um, this song always reminded me a little bit of learning to live, just in terms of the fact that there was this big epic song at the end of the album, and and the story concludes. There's a lot of samples here the news reports, the kind of sound effects and stuff like that. And it starts really dark as well. And I guess that makes sense because we're talking about a double homicide. But the reason I chose it for the song of the week is just because of how it puts a bow on everything. I love the vocals. I love the piano. I think it's very, very subtle in in its approach. Um, But what I love is that towards the end of this track, there's a callback to one last time, which is awesome. More than anything else, the last two minutes of this song, which is 
instrumental, by the way, the drum sections and the drum fills, the last two minutes of this song are probably my favorite Portnoy drum section in any Dream Theater track. It is a little subtle because it is it doesn't overpower the, the music. Um, and if anything, the theme is actually separate and apart from the drum section, but the drum fills are just absolutely perfect. And it puts a bow on the entire thing. So let me just kind of read to you a little bit of, of how this thing ends. Um, this is really from Edward's perspective, and he's kind of revealing that he wished the romance with Victoria was more than just a simple affair, and that it was something deeper than that. And Victoria begins to kind of reconcile with Julian again. Edward confronts both of them, murders them both, and then stages it so that it's, again, a murder-suicide, but not from his perspective, but from rather his brother's perspective. And... Um, he has this flashback where Edward tells Victoria to open her eyes before he kills her, which is ironic because that's obviously the same set of words that the hypnotherapist used when he was trying to wake Nicholas up. Um, so it is, it ends with Nicholas kind of coming home from a trip to the hypnotherapist. He um, is startled by another request to open his eyes. And then the thing cuts out uh, in real time. And you're left to wonder, did like the hypnotherapist follow him home and actually murder him because he figured out the murder. I mean, the whole thing is a little bit bizarre, but that's how this thing ends with a little bit of a question for, for the listener on, on the back end. But yeah, what a way to go after 77 minutes. I just love the way that this thing concludes. I remember it was always left ambiguous, but I think Mike Portnoy actually confirmed that the hypnotherapist did actually um, succeed in, in killing Nicholas. And, and like, I, once I figured that out and realized like the whole point of the story is that this, like the hypnotherapist was, you know, this, uh, this guy like looking to avenge, you know, a, a, or or to recreate the a death like it, it's so it's I, I don't know I, I don't know how you think of of something like this um, but I, I like that way whoever whoever came up with this line on um, Wikipedia I like how it, 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 what it says because it just says the band confirmed on the scenes from New York Live DVD that the hypnotherapist is Edward's reincarnation and has killed Nicholas to complete the cycle yet again I love that the cycle yeah it's of, crazy of, of the cycle of murder. Um, but uh, one of the really cool things I, I realized years after this album came out is that for a few albums, Dream Theater did this thing where they connected the end of the album with the, the beginning of the next album. So if you were to play Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence, the album directly after you finished Scenes from Memory, you would hear the um, the static from the record player at the at the end of the this album where Nicholas is killed. And that's how the beginning of the glass prison starts on scenes from memory. And this goes on, I think up until Octavarium, they do the same thing, uh, which is really very cool. Uh, I think that's such a cool idea. I think there's a name for the actual technique or whatever it is that they do. I don't know what it is, but I thought that was always really cool. But um, this is just an epic, epic last song. I kind of forgot how good this was. And I, I'm glad that you chose this as your, uh, your song of the week, because again, much like, um, you know, strange deja vu and fatal tragedy, like I mentioned before, it does, it has like a little bit of everything where like, there's parts that are chill. There's parts that are heavy. Um, the part where with, where the murder, the original murder is taking place and you hear the gunshots and stuff, the instrumental parts are so so hauntingly like like just evil like there's such an evilness to it 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 really comes through in in in, through the music in such an incredible way and um and just like like a really kind of cool um way to end it and i like that like in order to really drive home that we're not in 1928 anymore like they have it so you can hear the guy's radio and the guy's TV and stuff. And like, so, yes. and you hear the new, the news on the TV. So it kind of makes, makes it so that in your mind, you're like, okay, we're back in the present. Back, time. To present. We're back yeah, yeah. We're back with Nicholas and he's, you know, got con, con, gotten home from his hypnotherapist uh, appointment, um, which I'm sure uh, at that point he probably regretted uh, going to the hypnotherapist. <laughs> Talk um, about a bad decision. 
Yeah, not 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 good for him. Not good for Nicholas. But uh, you know, I, I had seen that. Um, you know, there's Dream Theater fans that are kind of clamoring for a a Metropolis Part Three, and, and this is, I mean, a story that could easily be because it's a cycle. Like you could easily recycle the story and, and create a whole new version of you know the the spirits uh, or the 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 carnation these characters it could be prior to 1928 or it could be post 2000 or 1999 whenever like the the present of this album takes place so it's certainly doable i'm usually against like sequeling things because i feel like you're setting yourself up for for disappointment i'm looking at you keeper of the seven keys the legacy um, Operation Mindcrime Part Two. Yeah. I mean, I can go on. Paradox uh, Two. Like, there's a there's a Land of the Free Part Two. Yeah. There's a lot of stop part uh, twoing. Maybe things. we just let's <laughs> let's just uh, not touch it. Although I understand that they could do it. Um, before we wrap this up, I just want to mention. You know, you talked about that show at the Roseland Ballroom. Not only, um, well, you talked about the DVD show. We actually saw them twice on this tour. Once we saw them together at the roseland ballroom um me you some of our closest friends and um everyone's and mike, favorite professional and mike, wrestler and mike what? flaherty <laughs> yes and mike flaherty and uh chris jericho who we met that night which was another wild story before he was um nearly as popular as he would become i suppose around february of 2000 uh, and then ultimately we would see this in its entirety in august or at least i would at that dvd shoot in New York City, uh, that is still the best concert I've ever Arguably been to. Arguably one of the most insane set lists I've ever seen. Like the, it was, the full show that wasn't included in full on the DVD, but go and look at that set list. That is like, that's literally Dream Theater coming out and playing two shows for everyone. It was ridiculous. Not only because it was this album, but they played um, that trilogy of songs off of Awake with the. Um, Voices, the, si- the the Silent Man, um, and and um, Erotomania, like the, not not in that order, but obviously they played it in order. They played um, Metropolis Part One. They played Learning to Live, and they ended the show with a change of fucking seasons. I <laughs> lost, which which was my favorite song then. It's my favorite song now, as I mentioned during that that episode. It was the best show I've ever seen, and a lot of things have come close. Halloween with Kisk comes to mind. Um, Avantasia comes to mind. But for my money, that was the, still the best show I've ever seen. And apparently, I think, as the rumor goes, I think Mike Portnoy needed medical attention after the show from exhaustion and possibly from um, like uh, lack of fluids and stuff like that. I mean, like literally pouring your heart and soul into a show. That was unbelievable and uh just yeah i have a feeling that at some point they could do a reunion tour for this and do like you know the 30th anniversary of scenes from a memory or the 35th anniversary of scenes from a memory i feel like that's going to happen i just don't know when but i feel like nobody would complain if they did this and a couple of their greatest hits at the end yeah um if circling back to that that february 2000 show um that was the first time that I'd ever seen a like, dream theater play a headline show. I'd seen them at Jones beach open for deep purple and ELP, but like, this was my first full on dream theater uh, show. So I'm just going to share some memories I have of this. Um, thank, thank you to setlist.fm because I would never have remembered that first band that opened the star people, which, Oh um, my God, that's so weird. Yeah. It was, they were like, if you, it was like listening to one of those spoken word William Shatner albums, but live It was <laughs> nothing about it made any sense. I really hope somebody with more knowledge of the situation could explain to me. Um, I'm sure there's a story like Mike Portnoy was like a big fan or something like that, but it was the weirdest thing. But uh, the Dixie Dregs opened, they played nine songs and uh, I had not, did not know that Jordan Rudis was a member of the Dixie Dregs prior to this. Um, so I never realized that, but um, they were a lot of fun. I remember being really impressed by the, the guitar and violin duels that they did. I thought like, mu- like musicianship wise, they were really impressive. I thought that was so much fun. Um, I remember at some point during dream theaters set because you know, it's the end of February in New York. Um, I had gotten to the building wearing like a winter coat 
and I'm in the middle of the floor. Um, and it, I'm just hot and there's just, everyone's just on top of me. And I was just like, I have to get out of here. Like, I'm so uncomfortable. Like it was just a, it was like a start, like Roseanne Ballworm was like a sardine can. And, and I'm just sweating bullets. I think at one point I'm just like trying to rock out while holding a, a winter coat. Like it was just so <laughs> awkward. So I, I remember moving my way off to the side and eventually I like, I'm, and then the back of the venue, uh, over by like, where the bar was. And, and I'm like, Oh, this sucks. Like now I'm like all the way in the back. I'm like, this is, this isn't fun. And so I, at some point I walk over and there's a, there's like a security guard guarding the stairs that go to the, uh, the second floor of the, of the Roseland ballroom. And, you know, I had noticed that there had been people coming, you know, in and out of that area. So I walked over to him and I was just like, Hey, uh, how do you get upstairs? Like, you know, why, how come people are allowed to go up there? He goes, it's, um, you know, VIP, you know, friends, the friends and family, the band, stuff like that. And then he goes, but if you ask me really nice, I'll give you a, a wrist bracelet or whatever. And I was like, okay, can I please have a wrist bracelet? And he's like, okay. And I'm like, is, is this happening right now? And so like, I'm by myself at this point And I just, I run up the stairs. I'm like freaking out. I get up there. <laughs> a, it's air conditioned. <laughs> like it's it, the downstairs is like hot as balls in a sardine can. I get upstairs. The first thing I know is halfway up the stairs is that all of a sudden my body is returning to a normal human temperature. Um, there's space everywhere, like, and it's it's basically it's like, like everyone's portion- smiling. It's like heaven. Yeah. Whereas yeah. down someone there, it's like a seven circle of hell. Someone handed me a pina colada. Um, <laughs> it's like a it was like a horseshoe shape around the perimeter of the of the venue, and I look up, and sure enough, who do I see? Head banging this this full head of blonde hair, and it's Chris Jericho. He had like a little. Um, roped off area. I think he was with his girlfriend at the time, who I assume is now his wife. Um, and I was, I was just convinced that he was going to be there just because that there was a, a paper, a WWE pay per view the next night in Connecticut. So I was like, there's no way Jericho is going to miss this Dream Theater concert. And sure enough, there he was. And, um, so I'm just standing there and I'm like, what the hell am I doing? I'm all by myself. So I run back down the stairs and I find all of you guys and I'm like, go talk to that guy over by the door and ask him really nice and he'll give you a bracelet and you can go upstairs. And so I go back upstairs and one by one, I see each one of you <laughs> file up the stairs. And, and and then the next thing you know, we're all together on the second floor, like watching this comfortably, like, holy shit, how did this happen? It was such a cool moment. And I remember watching the whole like second half of the set, their encore, they did uh, Peruvian Skies, Arata Mania. They did Paradigm Shift, which was the opening track from the first Liquid Tension album. And then, they did a, a medley called When Images and Words Unite. Um, and then afterwards we like ran up to Chris Jericho. I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want to bother him during the show. So I waited for it to end. And, uh, like we had a, a short like chat with him. I remember he, he, you were wearing a Halloween shirt and he would like had, he like appreciated that. I remember. And I was like, I, I remember leaving this concert. I was riding a high on life. Like I had just met like my favorite wrestler. I just saw one of my favorite bands play one of their best albums. Like it was with all of my closest friends. Like it was like amazing. I remember Nick was uh, like under the weather. Oh, and he, he was, was sick like, as a dog. Yeah. He was like, like screw this. I'm going over in the corner. <laughs> yep. He was like, fuck it. I'm going to this concert. <laughs> like um, I, I was one of my like just favorite, um, favorite concert memories of all time. And I know most people tend to remember the one that ended up on the DVD and the live album, but being that I wasn't at that, this one's a little bit more, uh, um, memorable for me. And I wouldn't see the band again until years and years later when they did the images and words, uh, celebration tour where they played, um, change of seasons at the end of that. So I got my turn. I finally got my chance to see all of a change of seasons live, albeit with Mike Mangini instead of Mike Portnoy. But um, yeah, uh, the, I knew that there was going to be a lot to talk about. I'm kind of surprised that this didn't go longer than it did, but um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to take the lead on this one and ask you, because I've always, I was always so curious where you would rank this, um, this album. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go back to, uh, some of our past albums. We started with Falling Into Infinity. I gave that a 7.75, and you gave that a 7.5. We went on to Images and Words, which we both gave a 10, a unanimous 10. 
uh, awake, awake uh, 9.625 for me and a 9.75 from you. And uh, change of seasons, uh, we both gave uh, an 8.52. Um, As an overall, I, I want to be clear because the song itself is a 15 for me. It's my favorite song, yeah. but yeah, overall. Um, so I'll, so I'll where, keep, so yeah, so where does do the honors. memory land? Is this album for a long time was my favorite? Then I would listen to images and words, and it would be my favorite. And then I go back to this, and it was my favorite album by anybody, let alone um, Dream Theater. I, I to me, it's it's a ten. This is a perfect album. It was a perfect return to form. They've been chasing this high ever since, although I do love Six Degrees. I think that that's another great album. Not a 10, though. Um, just it, it, This is as good as it gets for me. Uh, I don't know that it's my favorite album anymore. I think there's stuff that I like more than this. Uh, stuff that we've covered, like Mind Crime, I think I actually like more than this, maybe. Um, there's albums that we've not covered, which I would put ahead of this at this point. But it is right there with with all of the all time perfect albums. I wouldn't change a thing. So it's a ten for me. If the follow up question is, do you like it more than Images and Words? As I sit here today, the answer is, what did I play last? And whatever I played last would be the one that I like more. I, I it's, it's literally splitting hairs between their two best albums. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I I feel like I'm gonna probably disappoint some people. Um with my score because it's not a 10 for me, uh, but it's close. It's a, it's a 9.5 to me. Like it's close to perfect, but when you compare it to images and words, I just think that there's images and words is perfection with prog metal for me. And I think the last time we covered it, it really kind of hammered that home for me. And I feel like this album, as much as I like it, there's just, it's just a shade beneath and i think it might just be because of the darker tone to it It is i just don't enjoy it as much as images and words and and i guess like i i even ranked um awake slightly higher and and i stand by that i think i enjoy those two albums a touch more i mean you want to talk about shirts i'm a kevin moore guy uh that said (laughs) i mean i don't know that there's very many albums that we've reviewed that i've rated this high it's still a a very very excellent album i just know that a lot of people would agree with you that this is a 10 i just think it's a little bit below that for me anything short of a 9.5 i would have questioned you but i can understand uh not being a 10 i I have no issue with if you would have said to me this is lower than a 9.5 i would have thought you were crazy but anything 9.5 and above i've got no issue with that this is uh, putting a bow on on one of the all time greats, I am shocked it took us 233 episodes to get there, but alas, here we are. Um, I'll say this: I'm going to skip the news because we are going way long on this one. But I'd be remiss not to mention our episode for next week. A, we're going to have some special guests join us uh, from the MSR cast, both Sean and Carrie the Metal, or I should say Carrie and Sean the Metal Pigeon, joining us from MSR cast. We are going back to a band which has been um, an ongoing joke in many ways, but I have a feeling you're going to like this one just a little bit better than you did last time. We're going back to do some anthrax, my friend. We're going to do Sound of White Noise, the first of the John Bush albums, going back to May of 1993. Um, This is going to be an interesting discussion. It almost sounds in many ways like a different band from the one that we covered Uh, when we did Among the Living, which had come out eight years or so prior to this. I am just really looking forward um, to this album. We we have never talked about John Bush in long form. We are long overdue to do some thrash, although I'd argue that this isn't even really a thrash album, but again, from a thrash band. Uh, And and, uh, I have no doubt you'll give it a higher score than you did the last one. I just question is how high. Uh, yeah, I'm excited about this mostly because I am a big fan of, of John Bush because I just happen to be a big fan of uh, Armored Saint. And so I had always been aware of um, this era of Anthrax where John Bush was their vocalist. And so um, I know uh, that uh, Carrie had mentioned on uh, the most recent episode of the MSR cast that he wanted to, uh, he's, he's trying to convert me or at least admit that Anthrax isn't as bad as uh, as I had initially thought based on um our review of among the living uh which by the way was an episode we did three and a half years ago uh i was patient by not 
just throwing it right back in your face. We will do some more Joey Belladonna, that I assure you, but yeah. not next week. And next I gave week. it a, I gave it a, I gave it a five. Like I, I thought it was average. Like I, 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 to say that I disliked it is is not being truthful. I, I didn't dislike it. I just didn't think that it was great. I, I just thought it was okay. I thought it was a little bit like I just found it to be a little bit monotonous and, and a little bit boring at times. And so this being a little bit more into the nineties. I'm curious to see if they kind of go like the, uh, the kind of the King's X direction. You know, we talked about Dogman last year, which came out a year after sound of white noise and how they kind of, um, welcomed in some of the, the like current rock sound of the time of the modern time. So I'll be curious to see if that's where anthrax is headed in this, at this time period. But I'm always excited to talk to Carrie and Sean. Uh, so, you know, we're big fans of their podcast and we're always happy to have them on. So that'll be fun. I think, did they come on with us? Was it October last year also? I think it, it's just become Carrie's annual birthday request to be a part of our <laughs> podcast, which I, I very much appreciate. So uh, happy, happy to oblige. Um, it has been, it has been a while. A uh, big thank you. Big thank you to all of our Patreon members and everybody else that supports the show. We continue to um, do this because of you, and we appreciate everyone listening. And um, I'm going to cut it there. I, you know, this was a lot of fun, so an excellent choice. We will come back with a request in two weeks, which um, is going to be another interesting episode. I'll just say that uh, that is a uh, that is going to be an album which I'm really curious to talk about but we'll get to all things anthrax next week as we're joined by uh some of our friends and uh like i said excellent choice enjoy the week my friend and uh we'll do it again soon i i highly recommend um checking out the uh when images and words unite live track which um is on that through her eyes single because there's a portion of the song where um they do it only a matter of time and hearing like a modernized version of it with James Labrie, like in, you know, either in his prime or, uh, at po- after doing some good post-production, um, is really cool. Like that's, that's an album where I wish they would, uh, celebrate the anniversary and come out and play all of that because like if, to hear a modern version of oh, they've only done a matter that of time and status seeker the, the, they, oh the whole out but, but yeah. it's been a while right oh it has been a like, while it's been I, about 15 years but they have done it um and they have released it it is it is uh yeah and i, have it it. Worth I just would, i'd love to actually while. like attend it uh and be there in person to hear that album i feel like it kind of is the album of dream theaters that um tends to get the least amount of attention and and that, and and that's coming from a band who unlike some other bands I'm not going to re- re-bring up names but they really do respect their entire catalog in my opinion and they're very good about during each tour of like breaking out stuff that maybe hasn't been heard in a while which I really appreciate I'm super super curious to see what they play um on their upcoming tour with the new album um I'm I don't have tickets, but I may just at the last minute, I think they're playing in Raleigh in February. I may just, uh, just like gr- jump, grab a, a ticket from the, the second mark, secondhand market and just go because even if the Brie is not the best, like you can't beat those musicians in a room together and seeing Portnoy back together with the band, I think is, uh, too good to, to pass up. So I'll, I'll end on that, but, um, yeah, I, I feel like there's never a, a, a lack of, of, of words uh, for us, or images for that matter, <laughs> when we when we speak about Dream Theater. And I always look forward to these uh, episodes. But we, uh, you know, you could, if you want, you can listen to all the albums in chronological order and listen to pretty much the entire 90s history of Dream Theater via this podcast, if you so choose. So, uh, yeah, this was this was a blast, as I knew it would be. And um now I'm putting the, the onus on you that you have to pick the next Dream Theater album. I refuse to pick another Dream Theater album until you get you get on board. When the time is right and when I'm feeling it, I will definitely choose another one. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun. But uh, enjoy the week, my friend, and we'll come back next week with all things Anthrax and the sound of white noise. Enjoy, my friend. Nice. That's not just going to be like listening to people shopping at Target, right? Because that's the only sound <laughs> of white noise I'm used to hearing. No, although you might like that better. We'll see.